um, on this uh, phone call. So uh, we're going to put a poll question up um, on the line real quick. And if folks could let us know um, what your best, um, what your affiliation is here on the call, or uh, what is the best representation of your affiliation here on the call, if you're an advocacy organization or a nonprofit or legal service provider, a community member or impacted person, a congressional member of staff, government agency, or something else. So if folks could just type in their questions real quick, and we'll share the responses just so everybody knows uh, who else is going to be joining them today. The last five seconds. Okay. Oh, it actually has a timer. Oh, it has a timer. <laughs> so if folks, folks can put their questions in. We have a few seconds left, and then we'll share the responses. Great. As you guys can see, a majority of folks are, are in advocacy organizations or nonprofits. Uh, we have a number of actually impacted community members, um, some congressional staff, um, and others of different affiliations. Okay, great. We have two other quick poll questions as well. Um, these are more for um, CREC's own evaluation purposes, so don't worry, we won't be sharing these results with anybody else. Um, the first question is, we wanted to get a sense from folks um, how would you say, how familiar are folks with the issue of criminal deportation in the Southeast Asian American community? Very much, some, or not at all? Okay, great. If folks could put their responses and then we'll close the poll soon. Great. And uh, in terms of our last question, we wanted to get a sense from folks on the call, um, how much do you know about prosecutorial discretion as a form of administrative relief? Very much, some, or not at all. Okay, a few more seconds and we'll close out the poll and begin. Great, thank you everybody for participating in that quick poll. We're gonna begin today's webinar on our report, um, Automatic Injustice, um, a report on prosecutorial discretion in the Southeast Asian American community. Again, my name is Katrina Dizon Mariutegi. I am the Immigration Policy Manager at the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center, or CREC. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So just to give you a brief background, our report is going to be reviewing the prosecutorial discretion guidance outlined by the Obama administration and illustrate its impacts on families and communities. Currently, Cambodian Americans across the country are being detained and processed for deportation in the coming weeks after a series of roundups that began in summer of this year. Now more than ever, it is becoming very important for lawmakers, government agencies, advocates, and community members to understand both the shortcomings and opportunities of administrative forms of relief in the absence of legislative changes to our broken immigration system. We are really hoping that this report helps shed light on some of these very critical issues. So um, in today's webinar, we will be joined by our partners at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. We'll also be hearing from an impacted family member in Minnesota who is currently working to organize family ones are detained after the recent roundup. Um, unfortunately, our Executive Director Quinn Din will not be able to join us today, uh, but I'll be filling in to moderate our discussion and walk us through the main components of the report. So to give folks a, a quick um, context for this webinar, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our organization. So the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center, or CRAC, was founded in 1979, and we work to advance the interests of Cambodian, Laotian, and Vietnamese Americans by empowering communities through advocacy, leadership development, and capacity building to create a socially just and equitable society. 
As a national organization, we represent the largest community of refugees ever to be resettled in the United States. Our work is rooted in five key strategies, including advocating for policy change nationally and in California, community organizing, where we work with over 40 organizations to push both local and national campaigns, leadership development to build a pipeline of Southeast Asian American leaders, capacity building to support organization development of Southeast Asian American led and serving community-based organizations, and leading research to assess the needs and opportunities within our communities. So our report originally stemmed from a memo that CRAC wrote to the department, the deputy secretary of the Department of Homeland Security in spring of this year. The memo aimed to address the shortcomings of this administration's prosecutorial discretion guidance, specifically in its inability to grant fair evaluation for individuals with old criminal convictions who also demonstrate strong signs of rehabilitation. Our findings and recommendations have stemmed from the meetings and conversations that we have had with key ICE field offices throughout the year in LA, Seattle, and Philadelphia. Uh, these are the top three field offices that house the highest number of Southeast Asian Americans um, in 2015. Um, so this data, together with um, our experience doing advocacy on behalf of transformed community members with old criminal convictions, really created um, the basis for the analysis um, in this report. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, we listed our three main objectives, which is um, mainly to look at the shortcomings of um, this discretion guidance to provide feedback to agencies and lawmakers who shape administrative priorities and legislation surrounding immigration and deportation policies. And lastly, and that I would say is one of the most important objectives, is really to uplift the stories of impacted community members that we have been working with um, in the past few years. So, it's really important to understand the historical context that has made Southeast Asian Americans vulnerable to the prison to deportation pipeline. The Southeast Asian American community, as I mentioned earlier, is the largest refugee community ever resettled in the country as a result of one of the worst genocides in the 20th century. Because of this, Southeast Asian Americans have encountered many challenges during their initial resettlement into the country, including high rates of poverty, post-traumatic stress disorder, and poor educational outcomes. As a result, many young people are funneled into the school to prison to deportation pipeline while very young. Today, over 2.5 million Southeast Asian Americans live in the United States, but at least 16,000 community members have received final orders of deportation. More than 12,000 of these are based on old criminal convictions, or roughly 78% compared to less than 30% for other immigrant communities. Deportation spiked particularly after the passage of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act and the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act in 1996, which is responsible for the mass deportation outcomes that we continue to see today. These laws drastically shifted immigration policy to focus on stricter enforcement measures. And with the policies that have led to an increasingly criminalized society, this blanket enforcement approach has resulted in double jeopardy for many immigrant communities, particularly for individuals who have served their time and have reformed their lives. The political environment has also contributed greatly in how the administration has shaped their policies around detention and deportation. In response to the growing demand of immigration advocates to end unjust deportations, the Obama administration announced its efforts to focus on the removal of felons, not families, during his term. As a result, the administration released a memo in 2011 regarding the use of prosecutorial discretion or the exercise of authority to decide to what extent ICE will decide to pursue a deportation case based on a number of different factors, including positive equities or characteristics of an individual that demonstrate rehabilitation, community contributions, family ties, and a number of other things. The objective of this memo is to ensure that DHS's resources were being used to keep communities safe and keep families together. In 2014, an updated memo was released. Unfortunately, this memo also outlined enforcement priorities, or categories of individuals that DHS believes should be deported. Among these categories are those with misdemeanor crimes and aggravated felonies, a category that a number of Southeast Asian Americans fall under due to their refugee background. CRAC has worked with a number of individuals trying to fight their deportation cases. 
A number of them have served their time, reformed their lives, and have become contributing members to their community. Many are parents and siblings, and a number of their stories are highlighted in this report. Sadly, due to the felons, not families messaging around deportation, there has been an increasingly widening gap between policy goals and actual outcomes. And in the end, it is the families and whole communities who suffer as a result of our broken immigration system. With that, um, I'd like to introduce folks to our speakers who will be sharing their experiences working with individuals facing deportations based on old criminal convictions and barriers they had to face to shed the felons, not families label when working with lawmakers and government agencies. Again, I want to remind folks, uh, feel free to type any questions you may have in the chat box as they present, but please remember that we will only be addressing these questions at the end of the webinar. So our first speaker for the webinar today is Jose Magana Salgado. He is the Managing Policy Attorney at the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. Jose has almost seven years of community organizing and nonprofit experience. He oversees the ILRC's federal policy advocacy in the legislative and regulatory spheres. Jose's areas of advocacy include comprehensive immigration reform, affirmative relief, immigration issues, state and local enforcement of immigration laws, and working with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and immigration practitioners. Jose will be sharing with us his experience advocating for individuals with old criminal convictions to qualify for prosecutorial discretion, as well as general tips and strategies when pushing for administrative relief. Um, take it away, Jose. Good afternoon and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'd like to share a little bit of experience that we've had um, working with ICE and other stakeholders today. Um, so basically, we get to work a lot with um, ICE and various other stakeholders and government agencies in an effort to convince them not to deport people. Um, we often have some institutional barriers in that ICE really, really, really likes to deport people. And so what we've encountered with the enforcement priorities that Katrina mentioned is that ICE is really good at putting people into the bucket of the enforcement priorities and not targeting the people outside of those priorities. But ICE is very, very, very bad at exercising discretion, no matter how compelling for the individuals that end up in the bucket. And so this reflects some of our historical advocacy in that DHS HQ has to explicitly tell ICE who not to deport because of an inability to use discretion on its own. We often get pushback from ICE that claims it is already exercising discretion by only focusing on the people that fall within the buckets and excluding everyone else. Um, unfortunately, ICE disregards that the enforcement priorities memo um, explicitly said, hey, there are some people that are going to fall in this bucket and ICE, you need to carefully review their case to make sure that it makes sense to deport them. And right now that review doesn't happen and for ICE to exercise discretion, we often have to pressure them um, from various outside sources, from DHS HQ, from the administration itself. Now ICE has set up a prosecutorial email inbox, which essentially individuals can send an email when ICE denies discretion. And that inbox is reviewed by um, other individuals within DHS. Now, since its inception, which was between March 2015 and September 19, 2016, um, ICE granted 113 of those appeals, denied 384, and so those kind of represent how successful people are um, when they are appealing ICE's denial at the lower level, which in many cases they are not. So what do we do? What can we do to make ICE be better on this issue? Well, initially, unfortunately, everything first runs through ICE. So at the office, at the district office level, um, speaking with ICE in an effort to convince them to exercise discretion is always the first step. Um, if and when ICE says no, which they are often prone to do, at that point, um, you have to go up higher to the Department of Homeland Security um, headquarters and ask them to ask ICE. Um, but oftentimes there are some tensions because DHS HQ wants to provide some sort of 
um, discretion and authority to ICE and not step on their toes. But unfortunately, when ICE is not able to do their job properly, um, that outside pressure needs to be applied, not only to DHS, but also to the White House and this administration. Um, because at the end of the day, these agencies take direction from the White House. And when we've approached the White House, we've really tried to emphasize that this administration has really, in various other contexts, tried to minimize the collateral consequences of being involved in our criminal justice system. Everything from its commutations um, to its support of Ban the Box and other initiatives. But when we get to immigration, if an individual is a felon or has had contact with the criminal justice system, that individual is often discarded. So the messaging that we're adopting is you're giving felons a second chance in virtually every other aspect of your policies and your government. It makes sense to also provide that flexibility in the immigration context. At the same time, we continue our advocacy by focusing on outside pressure. Um, when the administration won't do the right thing, it often takes external pressure for them to get them to move. So things like contacting members of Congress that may be sympathetic, that represent community interests, that maybe have experience with previous individuals um, who are being deported is always good. Um, getting Congress to write letters or do congressional sign-on letters or ghostwriting op-eds for members of Congress or getting members of Congress to informally reach out to DHS, those are very good steps because DHS and ICE tends to be responsive to congressional inquiries, um, particularly members that are part of the Judiciary Committee in either house. Additionally, um, a lot of organizations, including CIRAC, have done a really great job in elevating these sympathetic stories through the media. So that's doing individualized outreach with reporters and media outlets providing photos and facts and a narrative um, so those stories can be crafted and the public can get a sense of who's being deported and why they shouldn't be deported. Um, things such as um, petitions and social media alerts are also good at raising um, awareness and at the same time reaching out to community leaders who can really testify to the rehabilitation and the value that this person has um, because oftentimes the most powerful words come from those who know these individuals the closest um, and just to kind of close up in terms of some of the strategies that you know we have found somewhat effective is in our advocacy and in our advocacy regarding external pressure we really tend to highlight situations if a conviction was expunged or suspended um, because those aren't convictions in the criminal justice system and they shouldn't be convictions in the immigration system but they are um, highlighting rehabilitation work that they've done in their communities testimonials from people they positively affected you know highlight Highlighting those ties to United States citizen and LPR family and community is always very helpful as well. The message of family unification and keeping families together is a very effective message. Um, also just highlighting the lack of a connection to their home country and how it's essentially having an individual be sent back to a country that they don't remember really drives it home for a lot of people who really don't understand exactly what our deportation system and the consequences associated with that system. And then finally, you know, we as a nation have started to have this great conversation on finally acknowledging the criminalization of communities of color in our justice system. And we try to extend that conversation in the immigration space. If we acknowledge Knowledge that communities of color um, have been essentially criminalized and minorities um, have been criminalized. It doesn't make sense to contingent uh, to make immigration relief contingent on a lack of criminalization. Um, so just tying it into the broader narrative that this country is having has been a successful strategy for us as well. So that's a brief overview of some of the um, advocacy that we do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over back to Katrina. Great, thank you so much, Jose. That was um, a lot of great, um, a lot of great information um, and strategies uh, for folks. Um, and really, to bring it home, I wanted to introduce folks to our next speaker, who really has taken a lot of the advice that Jose has um, mentioned and applied it into her own advocacy that she has been doing um, amongst her community and on behalf of her husband. So our next speaker is Jenny Sere of Farmington, Minnesota. Jenny um, and her husband, Chen Nin, were married last year and care for their five children. 
And this past August, her husband, Ched, was actually detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, together with seven other Cambodian individuals in Minnesota. Jenny has been organizing impacted family members in an attempt to save their loved ones from deportation. Jenny will talk about her experience advocating with ICE on behalf of her husband and the struggles she's endured to convince lawmakers and ICE officials that her husband is not a threat to the community despite his past criminal convictions. I also invite Jenny to provide updates on her husband's case and share ways that you can get involved if you're interested. Uh, I also wanted to mention that the photo on the cover of our report is actually a photo of Jenny, Chad, and their beautiful children. Um, so Jenny, um, feel free to take it away. Okay, hi. Um, thank you. So uh, when my husband uh, got detained, we, we, I couldn't sit, and we started to see more family members. Um, we have become now Minnesota 8. Um, eight people have been detained, including my husband, and we just, we, we, family members got together and we couldn't accept the injustice. Um, and I couldn't live without my husband. So we had to reach out um, for help and just learn, and we are learning as we are going what we can do um, to stop the deportation um, of my husband and the other um, loved ones. Um, <clears throat> one of the big challenges that we have with ICE is having them look beyond um, their conviction. Um, we have been working super hard to convince ICE that it's actually a benefit um, to have my husband remain in the community um, and also that he is really American. Um, we have lined up uh, meetings with our congressional leaders and really like my husband has a Minnesotan accent, like he is a Minnesotan, he came to the US, um, he settled in Minnesota at the age of six. He hasn't even been to Cambodia. He was actually born in a Thai refugee camp um, and had never has never set foot in Cambodia and has been here for 30 years. And so many of the other family members are on the same boat. Uh, none of them, um, have any real memories of Cambodia and their parents never really spoke about Cambodia because of the horrors they uh, experienced from the genocide and war that they fled. Um, and so sending people who fled a country, um, sending pe re refugees back to a country they fled is, is violation of human rights. Um, and we are trying to convince ICE to utilize this prosecutorial discretion, um, and it has been very difficult. Uh, as Katrina had mentioned, um, we, together we have five children. One of his, one of his daughters has a severe heart condition. And it's been set, and doctors have been told that the um, surgery she got on her heart um, would last until she was about she was 25. And my husband also um, takes care of his parents; they live with us. Um, and since they took my husband, um, our insurance has stopped. My husband worked for Carpenters Union. And we had all these benefits through him. And so our insurance stopped, and now we're all on medical assistance. Our home is falling apart, and we're losing everything we have. Um, and we're showing that to congressional leaders. We're showing that to ICE, and yet we still get this pushback. Um, and we can't understand why people don't want to help us save our families. And um, so one of the things I really want to ask is to the, to the public out there and to the members of Congress to really voice the concerns 
with Department of Homeland Security headquarters um, and our field office in St. Paul, Minnesota, and ask that they grant the stay of removal for my husband. Right now, it's still pending. They're not making a decision on that. Um, <clears throat> we have an I-130, and those are a bunch of legal stuff, but we have like a legal avenue to um, change what's happening with uh, my husband's case in particular. And um, they're not, they're not, they're not granting the stay even with the um, I-130 and the um, post-conviction relief. There is uh, Kentucky versus Padilla where if you weren't told um, that you would be deported if you pl pled, which is constitutionally invalid, like the plea is invalid, um, <clears throat> we have that relief. We could do that. And then recently there has been some some turnout. My husband, what he did is he um, shot a BB gun at a car. Nobody got hurt. He just shot the BB gun at a car. And so <clears throat> um, that is what's flagging him for deportation. He didn't hurt anybody. He just shot the BB gun at a car. And last week, Minnesota ruled that a BB gun is no longer considered a dangerous weapon. So if we can retroactive that, he would no longer be um, classified under that priority that ICE wants to deport him. But we have to get them to um, uh, grant our stay of removal. So <clears throat> anybody out there who have, who are members of Congress or or um, any advocacy groups who really want to help with our case, we need help contacting DHS, um, Department of Homeland Security, the headquarters, and um, people in St. Paul at our field office to, to see that um, they're really, they're people who have been rehabilitated and the stay of removal needs to be granted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing your story and being so brave. And, you know, I just wanted to share with everybody that Jenny's been doing amazing organizing work um, out in Minnesota. Um, so we're really um, hoping that things work out for her and her family. Um, so I think after Jose and Jenny have shared, I think they've both sort of clearly illustrated a lot of the weaknesses um, in this prosecutorial discretion guidance uh, released by this administration. Um, and I wanted to share real quickly um, some of the findings from our report that basically mirrors a lot of the things that they shared. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we had uh, three meetings with ICE field offices in LA, Seattle, and Philadelphia. And after these meetings, we found that there is really an overemphasis on criminal histories when evaluating these deportation cases. In most instances, field officers put very little emphasis or consideration into what we call positive equities of individuals once flagged as a deportation priority. So to take Jenny's husband's case, for instance, you know, he, he is supporting um, five U.S. citizen children. His wife is a U.S. citizen. Um, his daughter is dependent on his health insurance, and he's also taking care of his elderly parents. Um, and he's a very productive member of society as well. So even given all these strong positive equities, it's still been a, an extreme uphill battle to um, get administrative relief for him. Um, the ICE field office basically shared that while the recent memos have been helpful in giving deportation priority guidance, it was clear that they lacked an understanding on how this should be weighed against positive equities. As a result, many people with old crimes are typically not given a fair shot at accessing prosecutorial discretion. Additionally, due to the complex nature of prosecutorial discretion determination, we've also found that there is a lack of a uniform system to collect data uh, in instances when prosecutorial discretion is actually administered. Without this information, it becomes really difficult to assess how this system is uh, being, uh, being implemented. So those are sort of the two of the main findings that we were able to find um, through, these, uh, through these meetings. Um, and then lastly, just to quickly review some of our recommendations. So um, due to the really complex history and experience of Southeast Asian American refugees, 
CREC believes that prosecutorial discretion implementation has to be strengthened at the federal level in order to ensure that these communities are given a fair assessment of their complete history prior to being deported. So not only looking at criminal convictions, but really assessing positive equities and their character and their background when making a final determination, which in many cases, as shared earlier, typically does not happen. Um, so among our recommendations are, uh, we think that it would be important for the Department of Homeland Security, or ICE, to provide clarifying guidelines and technical assistance to emphasize a number of positive equities. And we listed a few, of ex few examples here. So for example, crimes committed as minors should be given special consideration. People that came to the United States as refugees with refugee status, and particularly for those such as Jenny's husband, who wasn't even born in Cambodia and was born in a Thai refugee camp, can still be deported back to Cambodia. Another is a length of time living here in the United States. A number of these refugees grew up here. They're American in every, um, every shape and form. Another is family ties. Um, and lastly is signs of rehabilitation. And if you look through our report, we featured a number of stories. And in each and every one of these stories, they fit each of these criteria. And sadly, a number of them were still deported. Um, next, we think it's really essential and very critical to be able to collect and report data that include a number of different factors, um, ranging from ethnicity, country of origin, and more importantly, really looking at an analysis of negative factors um, against positive equities, and also ultimately look at any forms of discretion that is you know, ultimately exercised. And you know, by providing training and instituting the system of data collection, it would really help us to be able to ensure um, a very fair and consistent way to evaluate uh, deportation cases to see if they are fit or deserving of prosecutorial discretion. So we will now open it up to Q&A. Um, I invite folks to type any questions you might have for myself or for Jose or Jenny. Um, you can do this by typing questions into the chat box on your toolbar screen if you're logged into the webinar. Um, we have about 20 minutes, uh, well, about 15 minutes. Um, if we're not able to go through all the questions, uh, we can follow up with you um, at a later time. Um, but yeah, if folks have any questions, feel free to type them in. No questions. Don't be shy, folks. It could be anything, even if, um, if you're an impacted individual or a family member, if you want advice from Jenny, sort of what she's been doing out in Minnesota. They've been doing an amazing job of really making sure that their campaign is visible. And then in terms of the federal advocacy level, Jose has a lot of experience in that area as well. Um, you know, feel free to let us know if you have any questions. Great, we have uh, our first question from Jenna McDavid. So what can folks outside of Minnesota do to support Chet and Jenny? That's a really great question. Jenny, did you wanna take that one? Uh, yeah, so she said, she asked what can folks do? Uh, yeah, if, uh, for folks that are outside of Minnesota. Okay, well, we have, I mean, there's lots of things. So we have um, just to, we have a Facebook page now that we've created. Um, it's, our campaign has been called now Release MN8, so Release Minnesota 8. Um, and also use that, um, the uh, hashtag Release MN8. Um, what we need is um, we need our we need DHS uh, at headquarters level to put pressure on um, our field office to grant these stay of removals. Um, so that's something we also we have our petitions online. We have different campaigns, different actions that we do. 
um, and to spread that um, out is good. Um, and, you know, we all have different individual petitions. And so actually we are talking about another um, action that will involve our petitions. And so we really need to boost those signatures. Um, so if, um, you know, if people want to sign, if people are able to contact Department of Homeland Security headquarters, um, put pressure, the more visibility we have on our campaign, um, that's helpful. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so um, I was just saying that um, we will be sure to share your petition with participants on the call. Um, if you could just email me the latest version, I could send it out to folks. And um, I just wanted to share that um, CIRAC has also been working with Jenny on Ched Nin's deportation case. Um, we have been reaching out to the Department of Homeland Security, and unfortunately, they have not been responsive. And then this is this is from the uh, national level. Um, we're figuring out now, um, we're trying to um, really push now um, the ICE field office out in St. Paul. So that's going to be sort of um, our next strategy moving forward. Jenny has been really great as well with talking to legislators on Capitol Hill. So uh, last week, Representative Elson, together with Representatives um, Mike Honda and Judy Chu, actually wrote a letter addressed to Jay Johnson um, demanding uh, the release of or an evaluation of the deportation cases of the individuals out in Minnesota. So folks here out in Washington, D.C., you know, if you're meeting with your lawmakers, I think flagging this issue would be very helpful for them. Um, as mentioned, um, Jenny said that they have a Facebook page that I, I can also share with folks. And it gives general updates um, on the campaign if you guys want to uh, get involved. Um, so thank you for that question. Our next question is from Katja Sengel. Her question is, has ICE responded to the report's findings at all? So that's a really great question. Um, we actually met with the Department of Homeland Security there um, at a Deputy Secretary Mayorkas' office um, last month in mid-September where we presented the findings from our memo. And, you know, they were sort of very agreeable with us that their memo is it's really strong in the sense that it gives ICE um, the ability to really weigh positive equities in these deportation cases. But then, you know, they agreed, and the field also agreed, that there has been an overemphasis of those with criminal convictions. Um, and we have been working together um, to try to figure out if we could come up with a system, and, and it's not going to happen anytime soon, trying to think through a system of data collection and data reporting so that the community and advocates, um, there's sort of more transparency when it comes to the use of this administrative tool. Um, we, I invited them to actually attend this webinar um, for the launch of this report. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think um, anybody uh, registered to um, join. Um, Jose was also in, a, in that meeting with uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Jose, I don't know if there's anything else uh, that you wanted to add as well. I think that was a good summary. I think overall we're also looking to see who's brought in after the transition to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, as many of you know, with the upcoming elections, we're going to see a lot of shift in terms of the political appointees, in terms of the secretary, the undersecretary, and whoever gets appointed um, brings a certain level of a certain unique culture. Um, so we definitely want to make sure we get some good people in there. And for those that may not be familiar with this effort, we're going to make sure to educate them right off the bat. Great. Thank you so much, Jose. So um, our next question comes from Eileen Morrison. She says, I would like to hear about building relationships at the state level. I am a lawyer representing a Cambodian American in Massachusetts, and we are, we are likely seeking a pardon from the Massachusetts governor. So I think Jenny might actually have some good insight to that because they're actually seeking um, a governor's pardon for her husband as well. Um, yeah, we are doing a pardon campaign. So 
the pardon's really difficult, um, but we're all trying. We're all um, getting lots of letters of support, and we've heard that um, it's really important um, that when, um, like, when our like when my husband writes his declaration, that he um, shows remorse. Um, and so we're really, so what we are trying to do is we're trying to, in Minnesota, there are three people who are on the uh, pardon board in addition to the governor. So we are trying to find out who they are. Um, and so there's a lot of like political work in that and finding, uh, doing power mapping to find out who are those decision makers and how can they be moved. Um, that's, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and, and also, Jenny, I, um, you should also talk a little bit about, because um, you've been doing a lot of great sort of grassroots organizing on the state level, so maybe even sharing about, you know, the rallies that you've done, the meetings that you've had with your mm -hmm. local legislators, and sort of how did you go about um, reaching out to other grassroots organizations to support you? Well, we we had to... Initially, it was just a call for help, and then people answered that call. And then we were learning about different organizations and having meetings with those organizations. Um, a lot of this, a lot of it, is thinking about what their interests are. So when you talk to different organizations, you have to find out what their interests are and how you can get them to be a part of your campaign. So um, one of the um, big players we have, um, well, Jacinta from Not One More, she was great and she came out to Minneapolis too to um, do a presentation and connect us with two different organizations that um, do a lot of the grass, a lot of different um, organizing. And so they then connected us to other people. And so we constantly go to meetings and um, meet with uh, organizations and people who um, want to be a part of our movement. And we also talk about the intersections of injustice and how we, the injustice to the immigration system, this broken immigration system, is a part of other injustices. So we get um, people from Black Lives Matter and other other movements to also stand with us. Um, and so we've been um, really connecting to those organizations. And as we are going, we're learning how we um, utilize people power and um, and work through that to help our campaign and to um, make sure we use media appropriately so people can see so it becomes a public issue that the um, that Minnesota knows and that the and nationally people will recognize the issue here. Um, so. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny. So um, Jessie Nguyen, I'm going to jump to your question because I think she's getting ready to hop off. Um, she asked, can you explain what you mean by positive equities? So um, just really quick, positive equi equities are uh, basically factors in a person's case that would basically make them an asset um, to really stay here um, in the country. So for example, we listed a number of what we call positive equities um, in the case of Chen Nin. So looking at things like such as um, signs of rehabilitation, you know, um, you know, looking at, yes, this person may have had, for example, an old conviction, but how long, how old is the conviction, what were the circumstances of the conviction, and how has he or she changed his life and reformed in the past few years? You know, how does um, rehabilitation show? Are they active in the community? You know, do they volunteer? And taking um, a number of these factors into consideration. Um, other positive equities can also include things such as you know, and again, in the case of Ched, you know, his U.S. citizen wife and his five U.S. citizen children depend on him both emotionally as well as financially, and they would suffer extreme hardship in the event that he were to be deported. 
Um, other things you could look at um, as well is, you know, uh, for example, if this person came here as a refugee or if they committed their crime as a minor. Um, and looking at these factors when trying to assess if this person would really be, quote unquote, you know, a danger to public safety. Because in essence, really, the aim of this memo or of this guidance is to make sure that, you know, we're using our resources wisely and we're not deporting people that are actually starting to contribute to, to their communities. Um, and essentially, because of the, least, the recent memo and ICE's sort of, um, their hesitance to um, uh, grant prosecutorial discretion for those with uh, crimin past criminal convictions, unfortunately, this weighs a number of these different um, positive equities. Uh, so basically, that's um, generally what it means. So we have only about seven minutes left. So we're going to ask um, the last question. So this question is from Gabby Waseka. Um, she asks, as a new administration approaches and the White House and agencies undergo transition. What are groups doing to ensure that we to ensure that we ensure vo voices like Jenny's are being heard? And what are the biggest needs for grassroots slash top groups? <laughs> um, so I guess I could speak in terms of what CRAC has been doing, and then may maybe Jose can also speak as well. Strategies that ILRC has been um, doing as well. Um, so I think um, in terms of CRAC, I think it's just continuing to work with impacted community members and making sure their folks, their, their voices and their stories are being elevated um, on a national level. So, uh, you know, with Jenny, we, we got to learn or get to know her through um, a local organization out in Minnesota that we um, directly work with. Um, and through that, we were able to bring her here to Washington, D.C. She was able to meet with um, a number of, of, of her lawmakers. Um, and we were able to sort of successfully bring her story to our partners over at the Department of Homeland Security. So I think just uh, continuing to cultivate uh, these relationships with the community um, and also the number of the different, um, for example, uh, meetings that um, Sierra has been doing on a local level to also cultivate relationships with these field offices and making sure that they're well connected to, for example, the Southeast Asian American community um, on the local level so that when deportations such as this continue to happen, that line of communication is um, already open. Um, and uh, what else? And what are the biggest needs for grassroots groups? I'm not sure what that means exactly, but I think um, the best value add perhaps for what grassroots groups can be um, doing right now um, is in the last few months of this administration, you know, I feel like we kind of don't have anything to lose. We just have to go all out, you know. We've been being super extra aggressive with the Department of Homeland Security, for example, with Jenny's particular case, um, with the Deputy Secretary Mayorkas um, leaving DHS, for example. We're hoping that before he leaves, he is able to provide some relief to some of these impacted family members, um, and I think that's important as well. Um, and Jose, um, I don't know if you have anything else to add on maybe some strategies that ILRC has been doing as well. I'll actually speak to the grassroots issue, and that is that um, sometimes there's a disconnect between the goals that grassroots organizations have in terms of who um, we should be advocating for um, and who maybe some of the Beltway organizations, um, with some of the Beltway organizations maybe being a little bit more hesitant to take on um, some of these more difficult cases or controversial issues. So I think one of the strategies that we've adopted is definitely elevating um, the needs and desires of the grassroots and taking on some of these harder topics, particularly when it comes to not only regulatory advocacy, but also if there's any um, comprehensive immigration reform legislation. Um, so we want to make sure that certain groups don't get thrown under the bus um, just because they may not have a robust DC lobbying branch. And we want to continue that communication and make sure that the community is always represented um, in both the administrative sense and the halls of Congress as well. Great. Thank you so much, Jose. So um, we're, I, um, that's pretty much uh, the bulk of our webinar. Before we close out formally, I wanted folks real quick again to take two more poll questions real quick. And again, this is just for CRAC evaluation purposes. Um, but real, real quickly, I wanted folks to um, let us know um, how much has this webinar improved your knowledge on criminal deportation in the Southeast Asian American community? 
So the question should be appearing on your screens. If you could answer it really quickly, uh, it'll just be really helpful for us to know in the future if we should be, you know, continuing to do this um, sort of research and um, doing um, these sort sort of um, webinars to educate the community. So if folks could let us know. And okay. And the real quick, uh, the last question is if folks can share. Um, how much has this webinar or report improved your knowledge on prosecutorial discretion as a tool for administrative relief? Uh, that would be really helpful as well. So as you can see, it's on your screen. If folks could just let us know, we'd really appreciate it. Have a few more minutes. Um, yeah, so that's the last question. So again, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. Um, the webinar was being recorded, so it's going to be ma made available on the CRAC website together with a report in the next 24 hours. I'll also be sharing links to um, Jenny's petition. And for any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to email me at katrina at crac.org. Thank you again to our panelists, Jose and Jenny. Um, and uh, have, every, have a good day, everybody. Bye.